session entitled, uh, When Others Don't Get It. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. I'm wondering if Linda Bobak in the back will come forward to be my scribe. Because I know that you're a nurse and I know that you have wonderful handwriting. Oh, you don't want to be on tape? Okay, does, who, who doesn't mind being on tape? Who would write for me? Jenny? You? Okay, come on. In my work with uh, boys who have Kleinfelter syndrome and also especially with um, trying to figure out how families manage the condition, you didn't come up, stand right next to me. Families manage the condition. <clears throat> we often hear, here's our writing. Oh. And you get two colors. There we go. Um, we frequently hear either on the parent support group boards, um, sometimes during the parent transactions, and certainly when I've had interactions between parents, they really rail about what do I do when others don't get it. So this afternoon's session is not going to be a didactic PowerPoint, I yap, yap, yap at you. This is actually going to be a parent interactive because we're going to approach this as a problem and we're going to solve it together interactively. One of the problems with Kleinfelter syndrome and the other sex chromosome aneuploidies is there is a lot that a lot of things on the inside of the problem that don't come up to the surface, so it's very difficult to solve that problem. And today we're going to talk a little bit about that. So that being said, this is a very safe place to talk. Um, I hope you will give me a lot of good feedback. We're going to try to lay it down because before we can fix this, we have to identify what it is we want others to get so that we can finally pull together some collaborative means in which we can actually solve this problem in our home environment and also in the external environment. So I'm going to jump back and forth between <clears throat> slides here. But have you ever felt like this? Whether it's in your family, whether it's talking to your son or your daughter, whatever the uh, uh, affected individual was, if you're talking to your spouse, we found in our study on family management that a lot of times there's parent non-mutuality. Parents look at their son's problems and their family's problems in a very different way, so they're constantly banging their head against the wall. Who has felt like this in schools? Have you gone to the schools and tried to explain exactly, kind of, sort of what it is and what exactly you need? So we're going to talk a little bit about that and hopefully keep you from getting this terrible headache from beating your head against the wall because I think it's a very unnecessary exercise. I think that if we can solve this problem together, we can take this as a tool in order to make our lives better in the, in the um, community and at home. So onions have been, I'm a cook. People who have spoken to me recently know that I like to mix drinks and to cook. And I use onions, it's been used in a metaphor many different times. But I look at the problem of sex chromosome aneuploidy and explaining it to other people in the form of an onion. It has to do with your perceptions of what this is. How do we peel it and why do we peel it? So if we look at that onion, we know that it has multiple layers. There is an inner core, that's also another one coming up, there's an inner core that's the problem. What's the problem that you have that's associated with your child's condition? And what are the multiple layers around that that create multiple layers of problems that are difficult to solve just all at once? Moving on from that, depending on if it's a raw onion or a cooked onion, this onion can be translucent or it can be transparent depending on the condition of this onion. How many people here have withheld parts of the diagnosis or the name of the diagnosis when you try to explain this to another person? Do you say Kleinfelter syndrome? Do you say triple X? And why don't you say that? You're scared, you're scared of judgment, you're scared of labeling, you're scared that the teacher will say, well, what the heck is that? And so where will they go? Directly to the internet. 
Exactly. And if we could take it all down and take it all back, that would be such a great thing. So we have to figure a way to convey what the specific parts of the problem are without giving away the farm. You don't have to say that your son has Kleinfelter syndrome or your daughter has triple X. You can say my child has, as Jenny Cover said in a recent, um, was it a, oh, it's a support call uh, that Jenny said, you, my son or daughter has a chromosome variation that causes her or him or her to have very specific learning uh, problems. Very visual learner, not so language based. That's really all they need to know. But they need to know that because in most cases, the triple X girl, the um, X, XY and the XYY boy, what do they look like? Normal. They look normal, okay? So you've got the 18 year old kid who may be behaving like a 14 year old and what did the teacher say about that? He's lazy. He's, he's not friendly. He doesn't make any friends. He's, and then how do you feel about that? How do you think the teachers are looking at you? You're not a good parent. There's a lot of self-blame and a lot of self-judgment. But part of it is they don't really get it because they don't really have the information. And it's totally understandable why we, you wouldn't want to give away the entire farm they don't need to know all the nitty gritty about all the different parts of it. They just need to know the part that's related to the problem. And then finally, onions cooked or uncooked can sometimes be pleasant or unpleasant depending how we look at it. So we have to be prepared to look at the problem of others not getting it and be prepared to receive the part that's uncomfortable or unpleasant as well as the things that are pleasant. When I went to nursing school, it was very difficult for me as I went into practice to take the soft, gushy Sharon, the mom, the wife, the friend, and then to present myself in a medical environment where I was seeing very critical things. People were making judgments. I felt I was in a position of risk or blame, and I had to separate myself and get kind of a professional shell. I have the professional Sharon, and then I have the soft, gushy Sharon. And so as parents, sometimes you're going to have to take that soft, gushy part of yourself and be the child advocate and not let those blaming things seep through. You have a dialogue going on in your mind sometimes where you're thinking, well, the teacher must think I'm not a good parent. Or the teacher must think we have a problem with our discipline at home because my son is not well controlled in school or I'm not, not working with my child well enough in, in her studies because she's not doing as well in school and therefore I'm a bad parent. So you think about all this dialogue and rumination that goes on in your head when in fact it may or may not be accurate because your soft, gushy self is getting involved in the problem. So that's one recommendation I would have is, is to see this. So we have a scribe here. So. Identifying problems. When you say they just don't get it, we hear it over and over and over again. Well, what is it that they don't get? We have to define what it is that they don't get. We can't make the assumption that if we say the name of a problem or if I say chromosome variation, that the teacher or the person we're talking to is going to have any kind of understanding of that at all. So the problem is, what don't they get? And then, who is it that doesn't get it? Are you talking about within your family? How many people here have extended family members where you've partially withheld some of the features of the diagnosis? And what's the most common feature withheld? Name. Say it again. The name. The name, of the name and also the infertility part of it. If infertility is involved, it's like you don't want to talk about that or anything that has to do with sexual parts are usually withheld because then you have the risk of your child being labeled or having dots connected that shouldn't be connected out of context. And so in your mind, you have to think of, well, um, what do they need to get? How much do I need to tell them? And what is the job at hand? And then finally, because you don't want to be banging your head against the wall, what will it take for you to walk away satisfied that they got it. So we want to come together with this problem and I want to hear from the audience what are some of the problems that you want others to get. 
What are the problems? What are the things they don't get it? What is it? That they're lazy and undisciplined. Another one. Right, because they don't look like it. Yeah. Therefore, it can't be such a big thing. It's not like an organic disease like cancer or some other thing. It's just inside of them. That's a great one. Mountain out of a molehill. What else? Yeah, motivation. They lack motivation. So they are uh, just not engaged with school. They're not engaged at home. Um, so that's, that's one of the problems. Well, there's parent blame. You know, you baby your son too much. You baby your daughter. He can't learn it on his own because you're always there to uh, not let him live his real life. You're kind of supporting him too much. Okay, that's another thing that they don't get. There's no stigma. People in the, if the doctors can't put it together, that the tall stature and the long arms and the central adiposity and several of the physical features um, that uh, you know, a person well-versed in KS would know about, um, we can't expect the public or a teacher just to figure out that there is some kind of a genetic variation that has gone on there. And what is it would you feel good about? What, what, what is it, if, if, you, if these things are like under your skin, how would you feel satisfied about it and say, yeah, that's off my table, because they got it. Say it again. Okay, so you want, um, you want agreement, you want acknowledgement, you want affirmation that they understand what it is you told them. For them to do a little research on it and realize there is an issue without saying, oh no, he's fine, he's okay. I had that happen with my son's children so they put them, oh no, every kid does this and all that. And I'm like, no, there's underlying issues here and you guys are not recognizing it. And they're like, oh, all kids do that. And that's actually- and they didn't do any research. And well, that's a tricky part because if you say go do research on a chromosome variation, what are they going to do research on unless you tell them the name of what it is? That is so beautiful because yesterday when I talked about family management, one of the things that came out of this qualitative study is that over and over and over again, the theme that emerged in terms of what do you need, parents need a roadmap or a plan. Even if there's not a cure for a disease or a condition, even if there's not an immediate treatment, if you know there's a plan in place for evaluation and some systematic way of dealing with it, does it not make you feel better? It makes you feel satisfied. And if you feel better and satisfied, then it doesn't eat on the inside of you and get to your soft, gushy part. Yes, question. Well, it's also much about research. Unfortunately, there's so much old information. Right, that's the, that's the scary part. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. So the explanation that this chromosome variation places your child in a community of everyone else, and we are all on a spectrum. We all have a spectrum of behaviors and capabilities, and that um, they are individuals. Uh, marginalization and stigmatization is a huge issue for us. But going back to um, doing research, that's a very interesting notion because it would be very helpful if we had evidence-based guidelines for teaching children with chromosome variations. So you can bring these evidence-based guidelines about, let's say that it was Kleinfelter and was not named and that you wanted to, um, uh, <laughs> that, um, Okay, now I'm having a senior moment in front of an entire <laughs> audience. Oh, evidence-based guidelines. Okay, if, if you could tell the teachers that my son is a very visual learner and that, he, that auditorily we need to take more time in order to explain directions to him, those specific evidence-based cues can be then given to the teacher without all of the doing the research about Kleinfelter and all of those things. So moving on a little bit.
we're actually going to be using these things to solve this problem. So it'll be great. Thank you for the tape. So when we talk about others, who are we talking about? Who's at the top of the list here? Healthcare providers. How many people had pediatricians who had not a clue? <laughs> not a clue. So that's one of the things that we need to solve our problem with, is actually bringing this to pediatricians. One of the posters that's out there in the hallway is a clinical observation guide that I actually made for the uh, Society of Nurse Practitioners that can easily be laminated and placed up on the bulletin board in a pediatrician's office so that they could see that even though at first glance a child may look normal, we found in my dissertation study that even in early childhood, some boys have a number of physical characteristics. And had the pediatrician just saw three or four of those characteristics, it might have cued him to ask for a karyotype. The beauty of getting a karyotype earlier is that there are more years for interventions. How many people with late diagnoses went to the pediatrician or the pediatric endocrinologist and they said, oh, okay, we know that he has 47XXY or she has triple X. Don't come see me until he's like 13 or 14. Till, till you start to see the pubic hair, then it's time to come see me. Well, guess what? There's 12 years in there where this child needs a lot of help and this family needs a lot of support. So the who's are the healthcare providers. And if they're not going to get it on their own, even to this day, new families will go to a pediatrician. And if they even mention Kleinfelter syndrome, the physician perhaps will go to a book and find the one paragraph on Kleinfelter syndrome and read it, and that's all that they know about it, and then they're on to the next patient. So we need to bring awareness to pediatricians, whether we, yes? Is your clinical observation Well, it is not vetted yet. It, was, it came out of a research study. Um, I did make it in laminated form and distribute it to pediatric nurse practitioners, but it will be available on the KSNA website. And I'll be working with Dr. Tartaglia and others in other centers in order to create a better, concise guide to make sure that it's all encompassing. But wouldn't that be easy if it was just even tacked up on his examination wall and he said, gee, you know, this kid's 14 and he's 6'2". Um, and he's got wide arms and the central adiposity. Those are just three things that would cue a physician that this might be something I need to take a better look at. So who else are the others? How many people have made full disclosure to the grandparents and the aunts and the uncles? How many people have not? Are well held? Now there are family systems. There are, fam there are issues with family. Some people don't know how to have discernment about how they um, how they would handle this very sensitive genetic information. Sometimes, because of family functioning, there's a lot of blame and manipulation within the family system, and so that's withheld. And yet, this child and you all are placed within an extended family, so how are we going to deal with how we talk about? Families know that perhaps the son seems lazy or is unmotivated or having struggles in school, and yet you're left without a way to explain it to the family. And so this is a need that we have. How are we going to, to do this? And we're still talking about others. So friends, how do you explain this to friends? One of the mothers in my study in her transcript said, you have no idea what it's like. I'm there on the playground with the kids playing football and nobody is choosing my son to be on their team and the mothers are complaining about how their son is not getting first string and their son hasn't had a date to the prom and I have nothing to share because I can't talk freely among these parents. Has anyone here had that experience? You're holding on to this burden and secret because you don't know how to explain it within that social setting beyond the family. And then there are friends of your sons or daughters and also their parents who are also exposed to your son and your family who might also be asking, gee, he, he, he's maybe different, but I don't quite know how to describe it. And so then what happens in social circles like that when this, 
when the secret or the withholding of information, what happens there? It's a perfect setup for marginalization. I don't want you to play with him, he's a little bit different. I don't, when he comes over to our house, it just seems really weird. But if, these, if there was a way socially for families to understand and accommodate these changes, not changes, but the way that a child is, then it might be better socially for the son to accommodate and to fit in and that the wider community, it takes a village kind of philosophy, the wider community can actually support the child and also the family. And then the big one, educators. Those, that's a big who. Who are we trying to identify? Educators. There's the individual teachers, there's the resource room teachers, there are um, school administrators, so the principal of the school, every, uh, people all involved. And then we have to identify well, what is it that we need for them to know. Does, is the it the whole enchilada? Is it the entire explanation of what this chromosome variation is? Or is it just on a need to know basis? What is it that they need? So we have to identify what parts of the it do we need to convey so that your son or daughter gets what they need. And then there's the gestalt or the whole picture versus the parts. It's one thing to explain, well, my son has uh, language-based learning issues and he's very visual, but there are also some other differences. So we have to figure out what is the picture? How do we want to convey the way these boys and girls are in a way that's a need to know and yet is very effective for the environment you're trying to communicate in? And then in order to help you be satisfied, does, usually problems don't, at least in my life, problems don't get solved in one great answer. Is testosterone the answer for everything? No, hardly at all. So we need to have some immediate goals, some, uh, sh some short-term goals, and some long-term goals in order to feel satisfied with um, others getting it. So I went on Facebook um, <clears throat> and asked, in one of the groups, when others don't get it, tell me a little bit more about this. So this actually comes from parents. And so um, one mother said, schools lack understanding around how KS affects our boys. So that's a perfect problem, but what's the problem with that problem? They don't understand KS because we don't tell them that's what it is. So we have to figure a way of describing some of the characteristics of KS that don't necessarily, like I said, give away the farm. Um, oh, here's one. I'm often banging my head. Here's the brick wall. As my son is approaching high school, it scares me he won't get the support he needs. Now, early, sometimes children will get educational uh, support, and then they might test out of it. And then they advance to the more complicated, rigorous academic curriculum. And what happens? They begin to fall back a little bit, but he's already tested out of, from middle school, tested out of support. So then what happens? So that's another area of problem solving that we need to do by reinventing this. Because as a child grows um, throughout their adolescence, their bodies are going to change, their chemistry is going to change, and then their environment gets way more complicated from an educational and a social point of view. Um, one parent said um, that there needs to be more neurobiological development and treatments that might relate to their education. And then another said educational and classroom techniques and supports. What we haven't seen here at KSNA, and I'm not saying that it hasn't been here in the past, is we need to be more, they, call, they used to call it multidisciplinary, but I'm going to call it transdisciplinary. It would be so great to have a pedagogy expert actually here to talk to us about how to bring specific learning problems to the school and how you can help the teachers. Many of the teachers are not trained in special education techniques, and so they outsource. Oh, you go to the resource room. Oh, you go to speech therapy. Oh, you go to occupational therapy. But I think we need to incorporate, because of the extreme variation in individuals, not only with 
um, chromosome variations, but also learning um, variations in general, teachers need to be more aware that there are different types of learning and be ready and able to incorporate this in a normal classroom. So this is what this parent was talking about. <clears throat> so then we have to ask, because when you're trying to solve a problem and when others don't get it, there's something that gets under your skin, right? They don't get it and you're very dissatisfied. So you have to ask yourself, well, what is it that bothers you? And so uh, one mother said the, the misconception that because 75% of those with KS are undiagnosed, that my child's issues are not KS related. Um, parents ask all the time, and it came out in the family study that we just completed, what part of this is KS and what part of this is my son? What part of this is because he's an insolent adolescent? And what part of this is because of the way that he thinks? Um, so uh, another mother said there's a need for karyotype before any diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, or psychological disorder. Um, I work at Yale University where we have the Yale Child Study Center, huge autism program. And I went to them and said, how many kids in this program have had karyotypes done to see if they have any um, X or Y chromosome variations? And the answer is none. Many kids in schools today are being treated for autism spectrum or being named or labeled or diagnosed with that and with ADHD when in fact they have an underlying chromosome um, aneuploidy or perhaps another uh, chromosome variation. So that is another area where parents need to make noise um, so that we can, if we can identify what these are, then we can place appropriate educational um, uh, interventions in place. And then, of course, one parent talked about the correlation between Klinefelter syndrome and, and autism spectrum disorder. And the musical question there is, is Klinefelter syndrome associated with autism spectrum disorder because of the extra X chromosome, or is it a standalone comorbidity that just happens to occur together? So communication um, and knowledge transfer is unfortunately what we are charged with. The, the few people who understand Klinefelter syndrome and the parents who are more experienced than even the scientists who are studying this. Language is actually our currency of communication and often because we don't, it's not that we don't have the language, it's that we don't know how to convey the information to others in a very succinct and effective way without giving away too much information and providing them with the need to know, it's very difficult. So often what happens is, um, we'll go back to this slide in a second, is that we can set up a very adversarial relationship, especially with teachers. And I heard recently in my previous study that a parent just went off on a pediatrician and challenged the pediatrician that she didn't know anything and she shouldn't be in practice and she shouldn't be allowed to touch people because the parent had built up so much frustration that the medical community did not know what was happening with her son. And so um, we have to be very careful as we compose what it is we want to tell people. We also have to be very careful about how we tell them and how we transact with people. Schools hate it when parents come to them and they'll say, I know my rights, I know the law, by law you have to do this, 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 and this. And right away the teachers are saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, you know, you're on the attack. And automatically from the very beginning, what is that set up for your child? A terrible environment. And then when you come to them again, if there are problems down the road, then it can be very, very iffy. So, um, so this one parent said, the misconception that our boys are lazy, undisciplined, willful, et cetera, it's already been mentioned here, when in fact they have a learning disability, sensory integration difficulties, this is something that is rarely brought up in school. But your child, if he or she has a sensory integration problem, it is with them every minute of the waking day. Um, and difficulty with language processing. Teachers and um, educators and physicians need to understand these things. Um, and then um, one parent says, and also add in, 
that just because our boys may perceive things differently doesn't make it wrong. Um, and teachers and people need to realize this. So it's really up to us to figure a way to convey this to others so that they are educated and then the parents feel satisfied this is, that this information has been conveyed. So this is another thing when others don't get it that really gets under the skin of parents. It's dismissal of concern and lack of knowledge by these healthcare providers. Um, and so one person said, what bothers me is when your doctor tells you there's nothing wrong with you, when in fact you know. Um, sometimes parents have gone to the pediatrician over and over and over again, and the pediatrician says, he's a boy, he's just slow. He'll learn language a little bit later, and then five or six years go by, and you finally get the diagnosis, and you realize all of the delayed diagnosis and the missed opportunity that was in there, and how does that make you feel? angry, am I saying it right, angry and resentful that all of this time was wasted when in fact you told the pediatrician way back when that something was different and something was wrong. Um, a, a parent said that one of their concerns is uh, a more in-depth medical knowledge by doctors and in particular endocrinologists um, of the holistic effect of low testosterone. Often, you know, we say in the literature, in fact, the body of clinical evidence says that boys with KS do not have androgen deficiency. They are not low, they do not have low testosterone. When in fact, their testosterone is low for their tanner stage if the range is between 500 and 800, or, and let's say it's 300 actually and 800, and their testosterone comes in at 310, it's a little bit on the low side, but we don't know how that really affects that child and whether or not that's appropriate. It absolutely falls under the range of normal, and so it's dismissed by the physician because it's normal. It is low normal, but I think there's something that we have to uh, pay attention to here, and sometimes parents have to be the ones to say, um, is there anything we can do to manipulate that low testosterone to see if it would make a difference in our son? That's one of the problems that we have in Kleinfelter syndrome is that we don't have any clinical guidelines that tell us the perfect level of testosterone there needs to be for your child's age, for your child's tanner stage, or for his symptoms. Um, and then here's another parent who says, I think the biggest problem is for health practitioners my GP found little but was on WebMD and Wikipedia, plus a few other articles in a reference book about KS. My therapist also was stymied by the lack of clinical studies. This is huge. This is why we don't have clinical guidelines right now. There are maybe four out there. Uh, they don't necessarily overlap. And so when we go to the pediatric endocrinologist and say, here are his, you know, here are his gonadotropins, and here is his testosterone, and now what do we do? There are no guidelines that tell a physician, well, if the testosterone is 310, you need to give him 50 milligrams IM at a certain interval in order to bring it up to 500. There are no studies out there that tell them to do this. And so that's why we have a lack of clinical guidelines. We're basically working on symptomatology. It's very individual and there's no consensus about what to do. So this is something that we have to work toward um, in the future. Um, and I, when I say the future, I'm talking about the near future, yes. Yes. Well, there's so much more to the story. Right. And there's so much more to the story. I think uh, Dr. Tartaglia talked about it today. It's not only the amount of testosterone, it's the amount of testosterone that's bioavailable in the bloodstream, and then whether or not the cells in the body have the androgen receptors to uptake the testosterone. It's extremely individual, and that's why we can't say you need your testosterone, serum testosterone level needs to be at 500 or 800. 
it, even if you measure that out of their serum, it doesn't necessarily mean that the cells of the body have actually taken up that much testosterone. So it's, it's very confusing for physicians. And one of the reasons is because there, there are no clinical studies that would actually guide them what to do. Um, this is something also that came out that parents deal with and, and struggle about when, when others don't get it, and it's poor and hurtful discipline in school. When the boys are unmotivated or the boys are seem lazy or they, they have social interaction problems at school, this is a, a KS boy himself who said, yeah, when I was at school, I was put out most of the classrooms because I was sleepy, low testosterone, sleepy and destructive, destructive, frustrated. We have to read through this. And so they put me out in the main corridor with a table and a chair to myself. So what is that called? Isolation. That is called isolation, marginalization, stigmatization. These are things that we have to bring to our educators so that this doesn't happen to a boy like this. What happens when this boy goes for a week or a month with this kind of treatment? His self-esteem, his self-concept goes to the floor, and then his um, risk for depression increases. So we have to find a way of helping the teachers make these boys successful at what their best aptitudes are. So if they're great visual learners, we need to find a way to teach teachers how to teach to those aptitudes. Because for a young man, or girl who comes to school and every single day it's a struggle and every single day they fail and then they go home and they can't do their homework and they struggle and they fail. What happens is they develop this avoidance to school. Why would you even go? We need to give them to teach to their aptitudes and also to praise them for this tremendous successes. They have a place in this world. And it's really our job to support the teachers in order to be sure that they are successful from the very beginning so that they don't have an entire school life long <clears throat> history of being marginalized and stigmatized to the point where by the time they get to graduate, do they think they can find a job? Do they want to go to vocational school? No. So, so um, this mother also talked about um, uh, exclusion, isolation is a common tactic. If there's a, a kid who's not doing his job, then if you, they figure punishment by marginalizing the child is going to be helpful. Is that helpful in a child without KS? Have you ever been sent out of a classroom? I have to say I was never sent, I went to Catholic school. That was really bad when you got sent out of the classroom. But it, I've seen other students get sent out of the classroom. It's very isolating and stigmatizing. Um, these methods lower um, self-esteem, increase anxiety and frustration. When they're already wired for this, what we're doing is reinforcing that. Um, it provokes bullying. When kids are marginalized in school, they're already set up to be made fun of or teased by others. Uh, and it does little to address the learning and the behavior needs of the child. Instead of saying, oh, this child is having a problem in this type of behavior, whether it's not cooperating or not understanding or not completing a task, instead of attacking it as a challenge or a problem to be solved by the teacher, instead it's sent out of the classroom as just a behavior problem. So you're going to tell me, actually, what needs to happen. But these were some of the um, su suggestions from our parents. A request as simple as providing the child with written directions, someone who has poor auditory memory. Is a teacher automatically going to understand that? No. We have to tell the teacher, you need to write these things down if you want my son or my daughter to get this. Um, uh, let's see. So give the child written directions who has an auditory memory or processing difficulty because they're ignored, let alone anything more complex or in-depth that will set the child up for success. So what you want to do is optimize the chances that your son or daughter is actually going to get the information they need so that they get it and then at home things can, um, things can get done on time and, and reasonably well. Um, and the reason we're given as parents for this 
is there's not enough money to provide extra resources such as classroom support persons. Well, that's probably true. Um, I know states, um, you know, it varies by states. I just heard uh, someone from uh, one state who said they had tremendous school resources, and I said, I want to know you because most of the families I come into contact with, the school systems are not very, um, they don't work well with the parents at all. But it's not only the extra support persons in the classroom, it's actually the teachers themselves need to learn to accommodate different learning styles. Um, and so uh, she says, sadly, teachers are not educated in how our kids learn. And the bottom line is the bottom dollar. And unfortunately, that's, that's true in most of our lives. So poor outcomes are often visited upon the child, like we talked about. Um, this mother says, teachers are unable to manage or direct the child's attention and support or accommodate their learning needs. And teachers don't come out of college automatically learning these things. So I think that with a transdisciplinary approach, if we brought educators to our table, we could perhaps change some of the teaching approaches that are used in, in regular classrooms. This has to be um, more than just a fix. This has to actually be a movement throughout, throughout schools. Um, in my opinion, it's clearly victimization and discrimination of a child with a disability. That's a very interesting question because some teachers, some schools may not understand that the child has a disability. And why don't they understand that? Because we haven't really disclosed to them as much as they need to know. That need to know is so very important. So the child is blamed for their difficulties. You're just lazy. If you would just pay attention and stop looking out the window or stop looking around, you would just get it. And the teachers don't understand, so they blame the children. Um, and too often, too little is being done in school to teach the child specific skills. Well, if the teacher doesn't understand that the child is a more visual learner as opposed to auditory learner, then that will never get accomplished. Um, and um, children need to be taught specific social skills, coping skills, and learning strategies in order to remain in an inclusive environment so that they're not placed necessarily in a special education program that might not necessarily be um, appropriate for their needs. So my question here for you all is what needs to happen next? What bothers you the most? What are the things that eat you on the inside? What is it that you think others don't get so that we can work together in order to help them get it? I'm opening it up. Linda. So uh, you would recommend then systematic communication, speaking up all along the way so that it doesn't build up into an explosive event. Yes? I went to my son. My son's starting kindergarten this mm -hmm. year, and my daughter goes to that school already, so I'm pretty familiar because I volunteer there. Mm -hmm. But um, I went to the principal and talked to her about syndrome, mm -hmm. and then I went and I got to request the teacher I got to the teacher's part of kindergarten. I went to the teacher before school got out several different times and went, took her everything I had from the conferences and we come to Denver once a year. So you disclosed to the teacher that your son has Kleinfelter syndrome? Uh, 47 XXY and X oh. chromosome is okay. the way I refer to it. Okay. Because I don't That's want what to, we all want to hear. I want to be careful on mm -hmm. people going out to the, and doing research and looking it up on the internet because I know when I found out and was diagnosed with it prenatally scared me. I mean, really, there was a lot of alarming stuff out there, and I don't want everybody else to do research on it and see the same thing I did and think, oh, my son is going to be 
a delinquent in jail, that type of thing. Just, you know. It's a common story, isn't it? Yeah. And that's what I fear mm -hmm. the most about that. That's why I try and take any info I have to them so they can. So there's a mom who talked about full disclosure from the very beginning, from very little. In, in a way, it, it's, a, it's an approach towards destigmatization because if people know about it, then there's nothing to hide. There's nothing to harbor. We don't have to worry about. Um, it's not always appropriate in every situation to do that, but you felt safe enough with this. I think that's a big part of it is feeling safe. Yes. Okay, we're making a list. We want to know. Are you all familiar with that? Um, we will um, write down UK educator <laughs> somewhere. I know I we will find that and post that. that. Okay. Um, I also attended some classes that were put on by like the special ed regional center. Your state mm -hmm. has these regional special ed centers that hold classes. It's so hard to find out about. Sometimes even the school diagnostician would send them out and you would get them like two weeks after the class had taken place. Because by the time it trickles from the, that department to the principal to the administrator to the diagnostician to the teacher and then it gets to you, you don't know about it until that time. So I attended a few of those and I learned about dysplasia. So to create a portfolio for your child. It's um, a great idea. To have a picture, it can talk of, of what you want them to know about the syndrome. Specifically, there are learning issues and then make four or five copies and make sure that that teacher has that at their desk throughout the school year. And that's really helpful. So anytime they're going, no, he's just not getting it, what can I do? It's something they can visually refer back to. Um, and then I myself had to get structured. <laughs> I'm a, you know, like wake up, what do I want to do today kind of person. And for my son, that was not a good combination. You know, what I really like about what you said besides the, the UK resource is making an individualized portfolio because nobody knows your son like you do. You see your son learning at home. You see your son struggling at home. You can think of the strategies that have worked and have not worked at home. And perhaps as you compose this teaching portfolio, you can include in it the type of information you need. You don't have to say online and in where? Student portfolios for freshmen and students. And you can kind of close the cover so that mm -hmm. it's not randomly on the teacher's desk. It's, it's uh, you know, but I've just taken the approach that with my child, we're, this is who we are and this is what it is, what it is, and there's no reason to conceal anymore. And if we grow up all talking about it openly at the dinner table, then he's going to be able to advocate for himself when the time comes. So there's less marginalization in the family. I'll take this and then I'll go up here. I was a kindergarten teacher, and, uh, to, and I have time all the time, and I totally love what you said. Um, as teachers, we are strict way too thin. Yes. Thank you. But, so I did, I did, but I did, we are willing to do anything yes. for your child, I, I, and the relationship 
Well, you're teaching your child self-coping yes. as well and cooperation with uh, people who are outside of the family, you know, levels of authority that are outside the family. We have your question. Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, I have a 